Hi there, and welcome to Next Pharma Summit and this session that's all about digital transformation, uh, turning ambition into reality, how we adapt to the new normal post pandemic by listening to patients, utilizing digital technology to accelerate change. I'm Clary English, I'm a podcaster and a broadcast journalist. I'm not a scientist, hands up, but I am absolutely delighted to be chairing this event. It's exciting to see what's going on in pharma and uh, delve into the landscape where you make products and decisions that have impact in the real world and lived experience of so many of us. So what are we talking about today? Well, <laughs> it's hard to argue with the fact that we're living in interesting times. The challenges keep coming, don't they? Pandemic, Brexit, climate change. Oh yeah, there's the energy crisis as well to add to that now. But despite, even because of all this, it's an important and opportune moment for pharma. There's so much goodwill off the back of the incredible work providing the COVID-19 vaccines in super fast time. Massively impressive. And surely that creative energy and ingenuity can be harnessed again. Uh, because this is the perfect juncture, as I'm saying, to do things differently, to think about how we can do things better effectively, while at the same time addressing a subject that's kind of hiding in plain sight. Mm -hmm. We need to talk about the patient, the patient experience. A person is at the center of everything you do and everything the health service is there for. Now sitting alongside me digitally, uh, two passionate advocates of more patient-centric approach, uh, Gaurav Sangani, who is the founder of Closing Delta. He's also a patient today. He's not feeling very well. Yeah. So I suppose you up a lot, Gaurav. Lovely to have you here. And maybe you can tell us in a sentence a little bit about what you're doing at uh, Closing Delta. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you, Claire. Um, doesn't everybody wish they had Claire's voice? Um, so uh, th this, this is fantastic. So it, it's great to have you here and uh, great to have Nicola here as well. Um, Closing Delta uh, is, you know, it's what's the kind of gateway uh, consultancy model. Um, it, it's all about making sure that we can bring the best of uh, pharma, best of the pharma suppliers all together. What I've historically seen is that, you know, um, people are very good at certain things um, within pharma, but actually bringing the best of the best together, um, you know, really is the model for clothing. So if you think of it as a package holiday, this is the VIP rock star treatment. <laughs> OK, not underselling yourself as usual. <laughs> got to say, Gaurav. And Nick, Nicola, Nick, Sunday name, I don't know, Johnson, head of commercial at Talking Medicines. Tell us about Talking Medicines, what you're doing there, Nick. Oh, well, I think uh, I can't. I'm loving uh, Gaurav's uh, idea of the Kuoni of uh, pharma consultancy. So uh, very, very good. But it's a pleasure to be here today. I think, uh, you know, in a short sentence, the Talking Medicines, we are reimagining patient intelligence for the pharma industry so that the patient voice is incorporated right into the heart of pharma planning. Because it is, I think you couldn't have said it better, Claire, it is hiding in plain sight. And, and we recognise that we're all in this for patients and how we operationalize that ambition is the key uh, to, to us all winning and that's really the purpose of our conversation today absolutely so you're both talking about a more patient-centric approach to what you do in your businesses but what about before we go any further very briefly your personal take on this human focus go up first yeah so i, I think everyone kind of knows a patient right whether it's family whether it's friends and you know i'm no indifferent um my father had a failed cataract operation i think it was a one in a five thousand chance of what actually happened to him could happen but the you know lack of information around that was was quite staggering um and actually you know it was almost like well yeah you, you know you've lost your eyesight in that eye now kind of you have to live with it and that's quite significant because it changes the you know the, the sort of trajectory of life for somebody who's highly independent etc mm -hmm. um and then i think you know my mother um as well she, she's had you know multiple conditions but following bereavement of her you know her sister she got um, kind of stress-induced uh, polymyalgia rheumatica, you know, which is an autoimmune disease, essentially just kicked in. Uh, we didn't know anything about it. You know, um, English being her second language, it, it, it's almost that much harder to tap into that sentiment. So I think, you know, as you said, today I'm the patient uh, running a fever. But in, in, in terms of um, we all know someone, don't we, who, who is a patient? 
Absolutely. Nick, what about you? What's your backstory and your condition? So, um, yeah, I think uh, for me, I, I, I entered the, the farm industry 20 plus years ago. And, uh, you know, when I joined, what, what struck me was the sort of ambition and the pride, uh, which is an industry we took in trying to make a difference to people's lives. We weren't selling Mars bars or Twinkies. We're, you know, we're selling things that actually change the trajectory of people's lives. And that's always been something that I've held very dear. My identical twin sister was a nurse and uh, I think that influence has been very strong. But personally for me, my partner, uh, Chris, is uh, a breast cancer sufferer and she has uh, stage four. Thankfully at the moment, she's got no active uh, cancer. But that experience has really sort of imbued me with a vision of the challenges that as a non-medical person, people face when they're trying to transition through this journey in their healthcare. And fortunately for Chris, well, she's got me and then an entire phalanx of medical people and the entire pharmaceutical industry of the people that I've worked with behind me. But that isn't true for most people. And I think if we are able to truly listen to the voice of the patient, we're able to democratise health in a way that allows us all to experience the benefit that pharma invests so much money and time into to really bring these you know, amazing cures you know, therapies and indeed vaccines that we've seen in the last uh, 18 months to market. And I think it's really how we just, for me, that's been a quest for, for 20 odd years and I'm coming at it at a different angle now, but uh, it, it's so important because it is all our lives and it's all the family, all the lives of our family members and our friends. And, and we need to, we need to own that and, uh, and, and really strive to do better. It's so overdue, I think, this conversation, uh, because as you've heard, we've all got skin in the game. We're human beings. We're not just professionals. So how can we find out more, more uh, about the patient to help them more effectively? Uh, also ensure that our businesses not only thrive, but become more relevant and connected to these patients. Um, we have a question for everyone today. We've got a little poll. I think Magda's going to stick something into the chat box, but I can tell you what the question is as well. It'd be great if you could answer it. Who do you see as your true customer within the healthcare ecosystem as pharma? And there are various uh, suggestions, but I think that will go in shortly. HCP, payer, patient, shareholders. We'll keep an eye on that box, see if it goes in or not and find out. But anyway, that's the question. Who do you see as your true customer within the healthcare ecosystem? I think you know what we want you to say. Yeah, there, there is a right <laughs> it's not a trick question. Not a trick question, <laughs> not, a trick question. not a trick question. Be honest, be honest. Anyway, we're going to get cracking because we've got quite a lot to cover in our conversation. Please do stick thoughts in the chat box as we go along as well. Oh gosh, this is a really simple opening question. <laughs> What's changed in the last 15 months in the healthcare world? Well, brace, brace, Nick's first. Goodness me, Claire, it's an enormous question. And with uh, 22 minutes left on the clock, uh, where will we start? So I, I guess, you know, we, if unless you've been hiding under a rock for the last 15 or 18 months, you will have, you know, it won't have passed you by that the world has changed. Uh, the way that people interact with their healthcare services, their doctors, uh, and how they access healthcare has, has been radically transformed by the pandemic. Um, Pharma's ability to bring vaccines in an extraordinary amount of time into the into the market and actually start to change the trajectory of the pandemic has been extraordinary. And I think that has probably given pharma, for want of the pun, a shot in the arm in terms of a reputational piece. Um, but it's also changed the imperative because patients have now, where we might have just gone, Dr. Google, uh, have actually had to rely on the internet, their peers, conversations with strangers all across the world to understand the trajectory of the disease and to get information that can help them navigate that and we won't go back we can't put that genie back in the bottle so now that consumer-based expectation that we as patients and people have is starting to move into the healthcare space i think it's really raised the bar for pharma in terms of understanding exactly what as a patient my journey would look like how do I get top quality information and support that will let me get what you're telling me I'm going to get from these medications? So, you know, there's there's just and I, even something like public knowledge of immunology. Who knew about that? You know, and, and know. how they honestly, I mean, I had to go and do a physiology degree to understand all that sort of stuff. But, you know, now that sort of language and lexicon that people are able to, to tap into has changed. And I think it, it's imperative that, that we ride that and we understand how that transitions into the, the planning phases for pharma. And expectations have shifted out there. That's the point. So, um, Gaurav, is it even possible that we can allow ourselves to slip back? 
I, I, ju I just don't think it's possible. Um, you know, we look at all the data, whether it's the, um, I won't steal their thunder, whether it's the Accenture data or whether it's the Deloitte uh, study, um, e even if we just look across the board at the amount of elective procedures now left to do uh, within the NHS, I think, you know, top of my head, about 4.7 million procedures sitting there. Um, you know, this morning, Ali Pastor spoke about Babylon and, you know, how they've actually reduced, um, you know, A&E um, admissions. So digital tech transformation, all about the patient voice. This is all here. This is not going back anytime soon. Um, but also, you know, where where does pharma kind of stand on it? Is it a sort of interested observer or, you know, do we actually want to get involved and do we want to start doing things? And, you know, I'm not going to sort of be carte blanche about it. I think there's some fantastic initiatives being done. You know, I can talk um, personally to Christine von Ransfeld and the work that she's done in autoimmune. Uh, you know, Tina and Prakash, amazing work she's doing out there in the US. Tina uh, Baradia in MS. So there are called Tina, I've noticed. That's bizarre. <laughs> but uh, we can talk more about the, the exemption mm. authors later on. But I mean, what you're saying basically is we've got traction there. We've got an opportunity. And yes, so much has changed. Did we need this reset button to happen? It's a terrible thing to have a pandemic to, mm. to use as a launch pad for good. But Gaurav, that's what we've got. You, you, you have. And it's um, it's one of those ones where you're kind of adapting or dying. And I know it sounds really sort of cliche, but there, there is, you know, we, we're seeing companies which are 100, 200 years old disappear overnight. And there is this kind of modus operandi that is changing um, in, in pharma, for sure, um, for patients, for sure. You know, even things like eConsult and what Murray is doing there um, is actually driving th those sort of changes. So I, I think um, we see it. We can't unsee it. And, uh, you know, we really need to get behind it. Well, I'm going to crack on because we don't have off long. But the second question I think we want to look at is uh, we acknowledge the patient is key to everything we do. But are we getting it really? Uh, why is patient engagement so difficult and why is it so important? Next. Well, I suppose I'm actually I'm going to reference Gaurav's uh, conversation with Claire earlier in the year on our podcast. You know, you wouldn't buy a pizza and then ask the pizza delivery guy whether you enjoyed it. You know, but as, as a, an industry, we found it extraordinarily difficult to maybe tap into the voice of the patient and to really understand how we take that insight in a safe and compliant way and bring it in to the planning process and to do that at scale. And I think, you know, to go back to the first question about what's changed, actually, our, if you think about AI, ML, I mean, the, the expo is littered uh, with with fantastic technology to speak to that and, and we're no different at talking medicines it's about being able to do that at scale and really bring that in but if we don't understand the patient journey if we don't understand the reasons why people fall off therapy or find it difficult to stick with their therapy or just sort of go i don't feel ill why am i taking this mm -hmm. you know i've spent a lot of time selling lots of different products when i worked in the farm industry where that was the case so engagement is the key to the outcomes that we seek and the outcomes that we see either in, in the sort of phase three trials or in real world evidence. But in order to do that, patients need to be active participants. They cannot be passengers in that journey. And the only way that we can do that is by listening to them. And if but we they can- they need confidence that, to do, do that, don't they, Nick? Because that's the point. A lot of patients might think they want more information. How do we enable them to feel confident to ask questions and know the right questions to ask? Totally agree. And I think that we have to de, uh, deprofessionalize the language, but we have to understand the language that patients use. You know, in the pharma industry, we can all talk around the houses about medical terms and we can get you know wired into our healthcare professions and do the same thing. But that's not how people talk. People talk about, oh, I've got this bad itchy leg and, you know, or, I've had a bit of a funny turn. And we need to understand that language. And that's what makes it so different. Um, to the professional language that we use in the industry. And in order for us to really speak to that, we absolutely need to understand that lexicon. And you know that is absolutely central to what pharma needs to do to really empower their patients, because that is the win-win-win. Everybody Gaurav. wins if we get this right. Absolutely. Gaurav, you're, you're nodding along there. What do you think? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think, Nicola, we, we've spoken about this via the podcast as well with Claire. It, it's, it's an area 
that keeps sort of rearing itself. Like we, we try and talk about it. Um, you know, I always joke about the brand planning Vex and Pharma and how many patient pages do you have? And if you've got like, you know, less than the ones that you're putting in for your digital content strategy, then kind of pull it back. Because, um, you know, to that analogy, we, we do not want to, you know, become the Amazon delivery driver. We, you know, it doesn't stop there. It, it, it's more about um, having the focus on the right stakeholder and the right stakeholder in any case is the patient right i think we all agree um with that and and you know we we all are here to make that transition uh easy for the patient as well you know whether it's in oncology whether it's in immunology whether it's even just lot you know long-term chronic states there is a lot that that can be done um should be done and you know with the gp appointment now being what 10 minutes seven minutes for the consultation three minutes to write something are we really giving the best back to, to, to the patient? You know, this is across the healthcare system. It's not just pharma. Mm -hmm. It's not just about doing the right thing for the patients, though, isn't it? It's about pharma itself seeing the opportunities here as well, Gaurav. Yeah, and, and the opportunities are there. I, I always feel that we see pockets of excellence all the time. Um, you know, and I can talk to a Swiss company we're currently working with, and you know that, Nicola, as well. You know, those pockets of excellence work really well. How you scale that... And how you get the scaling right is something that's missing. And that's where I see startups and, you know, these sort of VC backed ventures just literally go through the cascade so much quicker and so much better in terms of understanding the patient pathway and then being able to execute against it. So, yes, there is a role for pharma, but it needs to be less cumbersome, uh, you know, kind of more agile. So I think that there is there is an element that we can all improve and, you know, hands up myself as well. You know, there's a lot more we can do to bring that patient voice in. And with the technology that we have now, with the AI that Nicola's talking about, you know, we can go down to the medicinal level. We can talk about the drug. We can talk about that molecule and the impact it's having on that patient's life. So for, for me, this is this is all starting and it's only going to get better with more people coming in. And, you know, AI is something that everyone's talking about now. But within five years, if you're not using AI in some description of listening in and genuinely listening in on the sentiment of what's going on. And I don't mean just social listening, actually hearing what that patient has to say across multiple areas, then I think we're missing a trick. Why is that not happening just now, this proper deep listening? Go Rav. I, I think the, the reason is that we have not been able to access patients. OK, and um, we haven't been able to access uh, healthcare professionals. You know, so many people have said to me, I haven't managed to do my call rate because the doctor doesn't want to see me. Why? Because they're saving a life. Well, you know, um, so th there is there is a reason for this. And this isn't, as you said, the genie's out of the bottle. And we, we need to now start working to where the patients are. And, you know, I can talk um, to a real life example in rare disease where pharma hasn't necessarily looked at TikTok. But the amount of work that's going on in TikTok in this particular rare disease, which affects, you know, the juvenile sort of um, adult population. And it's such a missed opportunity because if you're not looking there, you're missing a big chunk of the voice. So I, I think pharma may think it knows it all uh, or, you know, and, and historically it's done it well via market research and other pieces. But AI, ML, all of these areas now really need some focus and really needs um, some investment, I would say to actually not just from monetary perspective, but also from learning. What can you learn from that AI? Nick, do you want to add something there? Yeah, I, I totally agree with Gaurav. And I think, you know, it, it's about the agility and the nimbleness. These words of, I mean, I've been out of farm for six months, but for the previous 10 years, what I heard about was agile and nimble and patience. And it, it's about saying, actually, we need to grasp that nettle. We find it difficult because of the multi-stakeholder ecosystem that we work in, but arguably, if we, we can make the coolest medicines with the most amazing uh, evidence that sits behind them, but if we cannot get the people who they're intended to take to take them consistently, all of that is for naught. We won't win, the patient won't win, and the healthcare system certainly won't win. And, you know, utilising the technology that we have and bringing that into pharma, we can do the patient engagement in a way that is, a, is more nimble, it's more agile, it's compliant, so it allows you to actually have that finger on the pulse of the patient on a you know on a weekly hourly basis, and that makes such a difference in terms of being able to test. You know, we in a in a sort of startup we talk about A/B testing, and it's something that pharma maybe is 
okay, there's challenges, there's medical, there's regulatory, there's all these things. I'm not saying it goes away, but you know, how do we get into that space of testing stuff and see what it actually means to patients and then really being able to kick on with the stuff that is making a difference. And I think when we do that as an industry, I've said that and I'm going to say it again, it is a win-win-win. And Gorav's spoken to it very eloquently that what pharma, the challenge is, is customer experience is a well, as we say in Scotland, a well-kent face. So it's well known to a lot of big players, your Googles, your Microsofts, your Amazons, take your pick. And the risk is that they will swan right into that space. And pharma needs to think so far beyond the pill in terms of that holistic value add piece and that's where, you know, the work that Gorab does, the work that we're doing here at Talking Medicines really speaks to starting to build that holistic approach to patient care rather than just thinking, well, you've got your prescription. Off. Yeah. You know, and crucially, so. there is customer demand for this. There is patient demand for this, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think when we uh, think about how busy we are talking to people, that certainly uh, screams uh, enthusiasm and passion for the subject. And certainly from the conversations that I've, I've had, I've been very privileged to speak to a lot of people who are absolutely passionate advocates about this. I think what we need is to make that a much more, less about the pioneering voices and more about the day-to-day -day voices. We need to enshrine that kind of mindset right into the heart of what we do in terms of the brand and content planning, because it doesn't just live with, I think the challenge is often we can think, well, patient engagement sits with patient engagement or external affairs. It doesn't, it sits right across the suite of the departments. It sits in medical, it sits in the commercial functions, it sits in the patient engagement, it sits in the clinical trials. You know, if you're we're looking at work for early launch, you know, what are you learning about your ecosystem before you get into market to understand the challenges that your patient might feel? But it needs to be a mindset change. The technology is there. The capability is there. People need to take, you know, sort of reach out and grab that a little bit. And I think, you know, both Gorav, we're very, you know, really enjoying working with Closing Delta and the, the opportunities that that's generating. But I think we're both hearing this sort of like, Got to do things differently. We've got a big hashtag at the moment. Hashtag do things differently. What will you do differently to bring your patient in? Because now is the time to do that. Um, and you know, and I think it's just it is it's up here. And it has to be here. Mindset. Yeah. Who has got the right mindset just now? Let's look at the exemplars. Gorav, you, you threw a few names around there, but let's look at give a big big up to everybody that's actually cottoned onto this. It's yeah, hitting sure. them between the eyes. Sure. In, in terms of pockets of excellence, you know, um, you know, I can I can talk to uh, Novartis. I think they're doing a phenomenal job um, in, in this space, um, but they also want to understand it from a commercial perspective as well. You know, they've got X amount of uh, FDA approval sitting, uh, mm -hmm. making sure that, you know, when they do enter, for example, the oncology market, um, that they're going to have this sort of, you know, value proposition with the patient and, and that they understand that patient intrinsically. So I think it's important on, on that side. Even some of the smaller pharma companies where you wouldn't actually, gen, you know, genuinely think um, that they would be investing in this space, it's brilliant to see that they are because actually they have to get it right because they're so much more leaner. So actually their resources aren't, you know, infinite in, in terms of being able to um, deliver an amazing patient experience. And I think, you know, the, Lots of the research that kind of comes out, some of the stuff, surely from some of the stuff from the social listening is gobbledygook. OK, and there is nothing actionable in that. Mm -hmm. and I think that's because it doesn't actually go to the, um, you know, to the molecule. It doesn't go to the drug and it doesn't go to that particular patient's experience of it. So, you know, in terms of exemplars, I, I would definitely say Novartis. But I also remember Lily used to have a board up in um, in the head office where you walk past it. So this is how many patients you've impacted today. It's really, really simple things mm -hmm. that actually bring the entire organization on this patient journey. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we, I, I hate the idea of anybody using the word patient centricity and then literally not having anything mm -hmm. to do with it when it actually comes to execution. It's and just a slogan, isn't it? An empty yeah. slogan. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and this is where we, we keep on checking. And, you know, the patient of the future is also changing because a patient of the future is much more informed. You're talking about expert patients, people yeah. who Google everything. And suddenly, you know, you, you walk in there and you know more about it than the patient information leaflet you've just been handed. By the way, that should be digital as well. We shouldn't be doing paper during COVID. <laughs> But there are there are examples of success. I mean, I look at Hummingbird Life Sciences, you know, a new bio that's just come through, completed Series C at $125 million. 
suddenly, you know, you've got a company that wants to work in CAR-T, wants to work in CRAS and wants to, you know, make, make those differences. So, yeah, I see pockets of excellence everywhere. It's all about scale now. Mm -hmm. Good yeah. news. What yeah. about you, Nick? What are you picking up yeah. on? Yeah, I mean, I think there's 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 lots of uh, great examples. I think you know the uh, MS space is a really rich space. And there's a lot of fantastic work. I was just watching uh, the bursting bubbles uh, MS videos that, that Ross have uh, rolled out, and they're you know wonderful pieces of work. You know, just changing people's mindset about things, and it, it's about you know Gaurav's absolutely right. I, I don't think we can think that this isn't a, there isn't a commercial imperative in this. It's absolutely crucial that we do that. Uh, and I, I think, you know, it's about how we measure our impact with patients and that possibly, I, just thinking and reflecting on what you were saying about social intelligence, I grew up, our ability to measure our impact mm -hmm. on patients is the key. Yep. And if we can enshrine that into the day-to-day, -day, so what is your KPI on patient centricity? Yeah. What do you measure? How do you measure it? How do you measure it? How do you measure, you measure it? You know, yeah. what, what are you doing? How are you, you know, because it can't just be like, I mean, we've got a big talking medicines thing up here. It can't just be big wooden letters on the wall. You know, it has to be actually be in and amongst it. Every board report will have something about patient centricity in it. So how are you going to measure that? Not surprising we have a solution for that. Uh, you know, in our tool patient metrics really helps you to do that and bring that in. But I think it's that ability to do that, which maybe in social intelligence hasn't been so easy to do. Um that changing that paradigm about being able to say we're doing these things and we're going to understand what happens when we do these things and then we're going to learn and we're going to move forward because it has to be a learning journey nobody's yeah. saying you need to have the answers out the gate okay but you need to i am i'm squinting at that clock and i, really I know want i was thinking like, about shut up boys. i know we could sit here all day sorry everybody <laughs> we absolutely could, could be a coup uh i want to ask you first of all next and then gaurav how do you make sure you build on this new knowledge and bring consistency to your patient engagement approach? Next, you start us off. Goodness. I think it's about understanding what uh, solutions are out there for you and then coming to speak to people like Gorav and I, actually, and understand how we can help you. Because we are absolutely invested in this for the patient yeah. and we want to see everybody in pharma do the right thing for their patients. And it's about reaching out into the space and saying, right, what are we going to do tomorrow differently? How are we going to walk the walk and talk the talk? Um, so that, that is my sort of challenge, really, is, is to say, you know, if you want to do things differently, then you need to you know, start speaking to people like Gaurav and I to, to really help you find those solutions and, uh, and enshrine them into your planning. Yeah, go ahead. And, and I agree with that. I, th I think there's a there's a passion that comes across from, you know, what we're doing. Having been on the other side in terms of pharma, I know the great work that's been done. Um, you know, the vaccine stuff we spoke about earlier, but people don't even realise, you know, how quickly that vaccine was developed and what sort of time frame, what computer modelling and all of those sort of things um, that went into all those things. In, in terms of the patient itself, I look... The, this has to be central and key. If you have a KPI against sales and you don't have a KPI against patient, well, you've missed the idea of why we're we doing what we're doing. OK. Um, and as much as I love AI where you want to actually sell more medication, which is fine. But actually, the reality is that, you know, even medication that's sold. Right. The patient's not taking for whatever reason, whether it's a side effect profile or whether or not they even know what the dosing regime is. So the worst thing for a pharma company is to develop a drug, go through the approval process and then think that your drug is not efficacious because that is what your patient is telling you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm not taking it. So the outcome is worse. So I think there's a huge piece of work to be done. I think pharma, patient bodies, you know, patient advocates all work hand in hand. And the technology and the digital transformation, and Tiago said it beautifully earlier today, starts with the people. If we start with the people, we're not going to go far wrong. Absolutely. OK, uh, a final point, really, if not now, when? Because we're all talking about this has to happen. But of course, it has to be embedded. It has to have traction because it's all very well taking the action. You've got to keep it going. Nick's. Yeah, I think it's it's that sort of if not now when and if not you you know if not you then who you know because people are going to jump onto this and there are people already doing that we've, we've spoken to that and um, so I think you know if you're sitting listening to us and thinking flipping egg we're missing a trick here you know great that is fantastic that is actually the first step that you see a gap. Uh, you then need to step into that gap. It's a bit like startup founders having brilliant ideas in the shower. Well, they die in the shower if you don't write them down and tell somebody about them. So, you know, come on and, you know, tell us about your ideas. Tell us what it is you're trying to do. There are some brilliant, you know, we've got products, 
Gorav's got products. There are brilliant people who can help you to achieve this ambition for the betterment of patients. But you need to start that journey today. You cannot wait. Gorav. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be hard to follow that up with the uh, psycho um, so, sort of analogy. Um, but in, in terms of where, where we sit, I think, you know, Closing Delta um, is about bringing the best, um, you know, suppliers together. And whether that's in terms of patient metrics and the data that you can have as a KPI for your patient engagement, or whether that's Markify when it comes to behavioral science execution, or whether that's, you know, our partners at Cyboc and we're writing the best patient material out there. So lots and lots of these things are about working in unison. We're not going to solve it all in one go. But remember one thing, there's never more than 21 working days in any given month. So you make sure that your focus is still on that patient. What a way to end. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. We're at the end of our session. I hope you agree this is a conversation worth having and continuing. Uh, we're knee deep in healthcare and existential challenges, yet there's so much opportunity out there. Let's start thinking about the patient's experience. Uh, we can do much better. And in order to harness your expertise, your uh, your creative energy and your compassion as a human being. Nixon Gorov are very keen to talk to you if you want some more information, how they can help you spot the opportunities and begin to establish a genuine, lasting engagement with patients. It's no longer good enough to tick that box that says we already do social listening. Absolutely not good enough. Get ahead of the curve. Be pioneering. It really is in your gift to change things. Don't know what happened to that poll result, but it'd be great if you could fill it in anyway, and then we can crunch down on it later on. And do bear in mind, as, as the guys just said, others are lining up, ready to jump into this space. Health is yet another sector where it's democratized. The likes of Amazon and Google are poised. Grasp the opportunity. Make sure that pharma plays a leading role in improving prospects for the patients, for everybody. Thank you for your time. Thank Thanks you. very much.